but the actual potential of, of consistently bringing in more business is like a big deal. Very exciting. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today, we welcome architect Dewey Nichols to the Business of Architecture podcast. Nichols is a leading residential architect based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And in this interview, Nichols discusses managing difficult clients, the challenges and pleasures of having a small practice, and much more. Now, before we get into that, if you haven't already gotten access to our 60-minute firm owner masterclass on the smart practice method, what are you waiting for? On that training, you'll discover how you can implement and what is the framework of the smart practice method to be able to run a small architectural practice that suits your life. For more information, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com and register today. Now, here's my interview with architect Dewey Nichols. Hello, Dewey, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Hi, Enoch. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So we met We met first a couple of years ago. I think it's been over a little bit over two years now uh, when you reached out to me here at Business of Architecture uh, because you had seen some of what we're doing here, how we help small fr- firm practices succeed, how we help them achieve their goals, build the practices, suit their life. And uh, I'm just curious for you, what was it that caused you originally? Do you remember what it was that caused you to reach out to uh, to me here? I do. I was uh, probably relaying one of my complaint sessions to a um, a fellow uh, Charles River Chamber of Commerce member, Steve Baker from Baker Design Associates. He's out in Wellesley and I believe he is uh, also a, has done some business of architecture classes with you guys as well. And he just said, do we sound like you need to speak with Enix Sears yes. of business of architecture? So he told me a little bit about what you guys do. And, um, you know, I looked into a little bit and saw that you were sort of sanctioned by the AIA. And I thought this makes some good sense to like explore this a little bit. So then I called you and the rest is history. Two years later, going on three now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember that. Yeah, I remember Stephen. Uh, it's a great, great guy and uh, super cool that he introduced you to us. Now, you were talking about some of the complaints. Um, here's the thing, right? We know as people running a business that businesses are not easy to run, uh, primarily because there's so many different things that need to happen in a business, especially as a micro practice or, or a, someone that has a very limited team. It's There's a lot to do. It's one person wearing a lot of hats, right? And for you, what, what, were, what were some of the complaints at that time, if you can think back two years ago, that you were experiencing the unwanted um, things that were showing up in your life that you were dealing with? Yeah, I mean, it's that balance between marketing and and servicing the clients it was it was sort of like you know when i when i was busy and had a lot of work i'd be you know working away at at making it work for the clients and dancing for them and then marketing would fall by the wayside and i would have these crashes of 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 workflow so i think that was always the struggle and and furthermore you know i think I always put the client first and kind of jumping into some of the things that I've learned through business of architecture is that, that really the business is my first and foremost um, requirement or prerequisite, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's where I really need to think this is the piece that is the most important to my existence. And when I put the client first, I put the business second and it always meant that I was cutting fees. You know, they would, they would whine a little bit and I would immediately cave and and I would, I would be like working for them for free. And it made it so that my cash flow was just constantly getting worse and worse and worse. And, you know, I think that's for me, that's what caused my biggest whine. I think was, just the lack of money and the constant work. Um, and I think that's some of the stuff that we've worked to change a good bit. So maybe does that answer the question? Yeah, it's a great answer. And what it brings to mind for me is that uh, as architecture professionals, we are not, like here's the thing, when I went into architecture, I didn't go into architecture because 
I love to work with people. Okay. That doesn't mean that I don't like, that I like or dislike working with people, but I know there are some careers out there where like people specifically choose them because they like working with people. For instance, you know, maybe a social worker or a therapist or someone in the medical profession because they know they're going to be working with people on a daily basis. And uh, when I look at the, the, the landscape of architects and why we go into architecture, I don't know many people that go into architecture specifically because they want to work with people. I don't think it's, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't like working with people, but usually people go into architecture because they feel a calling, they feel they, they, they want to design, they, want to, they have an artistic side, they want to express, they, they get joy out of that, they want to be involved in a creative process. And yet, as you pointed out, especially when running a small residentially focused architectural practice, you're working with people. I mean, you're really, if you think about it, you're kind of, you're kind of, that's your main thing is working with people. Yeah. There are pluses and minuses to that. You know, it's, it's sort of like, I always say we become our clients' friends and it's true, but it's also to our detriment because as soon as you become their friend, then you're somewhat at their mercy of, oh, you know, if they don't want to pay you more money, how do you, how do you (laughs) tell your friend you've got to pay me more money? You know, it's, uh, it's weird. It's this, this dichotomy i guess is a good word for it it's sort of like you want to be their friend but then you don't want to be their friend yeah yeah exactly and uh when we have these conversations uh when money gets thrown into the mix we're having conversations about money uh it makes it difficult for us as people to uh it makes it awkward and so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll ignore the conversation or we'll do extra work we'll try to throw things in for free because of that awkwardness of not being sure how to have that conversation, um, not being sure where our own boundaries are, and like you said, wanting to put the client first. So yeah, what- as soon as it, yeah, absolutely. As as soon as you get some sort of idea that they're uncomfortable, they're starting to feel uncomfortable. You want to take that discomfort away, mm, and you always do it. it at your at your own expense. Yeah, so that's, I mm-hmm. absorb their discomfort by being financially uncomfortable. Exactly. Exactly. And what were some of the results that you you experienced because of that? So that was sort of, we have a root cause there, which is the discomfort of having a conversation around money and and wanting to please our clients. And then that creates symptoms. So you mentioned the, the feature flow, uh, you, you mentioned cash flow being an issue. Um, what what are some of the other consequences of, of, of showing up that way? Consequences of feast or famine? Um, well, I mean, it's a constant, you know, like no vacations. <laughs> I never had one until just recently. Um, it's, it's a constant strain on your time. So there's really the, the whole work life balance is totally skewed. You end up just, it, it's all about work. And, you know, I have to say it hasn't changed that much at this point. But I do make time for vacations now. And when family comes into town, I'm, I'm able to like at least be there for them. So, you know, that's better. I mean, I, by nature, I like to work hard. So I, I don't know that I see that really changing. Um, it's never been a goal of mine to like only work four days a week. In all honesty, I don't know what I would do <laughs> yeah. with my other three days a week. And I think that's one thing that, that, you know, I do is just specifically with Ryan is, is we, we talk about our dreams. And I think one thing that I found, I had stopped dreaming. I just, I just was just work. That's, mm. that's all I was. And, you know, kind of jump starting your, your spirit a little bit to, to like start dreaming again is, is a bit of a, that's a, a fascinating, if not sad question. I mean, I can look at it like sad or I can look at it like in a positive way, like, well, to like actually get some dreaming back, just be an amazing, wonderful thing. So and it's not a common. I mean, a lot of us stop dreaming. Absolutely. And uh, it's it's interesting. What is what is dreaming done for you being able to turn that back on again? Well, I think, you know, with my colleagues in class, for one thing, it's like they all dream so much bigger than I do. It's like for me, you know, if I make. $300,000 in a year for myself, then I feel like, well, I'm doing okay. But, you know, then I'm with colleagues that are making a million or 10 million and and their pipelines are huge. And I think to myself, oh my God, and you're happy with just this little bit of amount of 
pipeline. It's like, that's insane. It's like, why aren't you thinking bigger? Why, when did you stop thinking big? Mm. And, and I, I just, you know, I just, that to me is the most fascinating, that sort of um, self-awareness that I'm getting about, about my own attitudes and how that impacts my business and, and where we're, we're going to go in the future. Because I just feel like it's sort of on me at this point to like do the big dream. Um, you know, I don't want it to be like so big that, that you know, I'm not going to become the next Stantec or something like that. That's not my, it's not my goal. It never will be, but to have it be something that's significant enough that, you know, leaves more of a legacy than when I die, Nichols Design Group dies too. I think that that's, that's a valid dream and that somehow all that I've worked for is going to like, it's, it's going to be something that carries on after me. I think that's, that's a cool thing. You know, some of my design ethic and whatever will go on. It's a good goal. And it sounds fun. I mean, uh -huh. let's face it. Well, you guys make it fun. I mean, when you're working by yourself, in all honesty, it's, mm -hmm. um, you don't even stop to like think about things like this. But with you guys, it's like all of a sudden there's this, this an array of, of colleagues who a lot of them have the exact same kind of experiences and dynamics. And, and so they're sharing what it's been like for them. And you're like, Oh my God, I'm not the only one. And mm -hmm. it isn't just me that this is, is something that's, that's happening, happening outside of my box. And that's a really cool thing. It's because I think often when you're just working by yourself and you're, you're, you're tunnel vision and, and you're just thinking about your own experience and then you blame yourself for your own experience and you don't realize that there's a dynamic that every architect experiences, no, really, no matter how big their firm is, they're still, they're still struggling with the same stuff. And it's not my lack of, of um, skills or expertise. It's more of my lack of awareness about mm. that. It's not just me. Mm. And that's <laughs> a lot of, we actually deal with a lot of um, mind stuff. Mm. And, and I think that that's, probably been one of the best things because you know getting the mind stuff in order first so that then the being is manifest in a different way in a more positive and fulfilling way is is really i think what i'm experiencing at this point mm. yeah i love that uh it was interesting it was just reminding me on a, on a call one of our you know, as part of smart practice, people get access to different different group calls that we run. And on one of the calls we were just on, uh, one of the architects, it was very common, was just um, she was getting ready to go for a, a much larger fee than she'd ever quoted in the past. And, um, you know, kind of wondering how to position this, how to, you know, feeling a lack of certainty. We've all been there when we're charging more than we've ever charged in the past. There's that, there's that initial thing like, ooh, is this going to work? You know, we want it to work. We see the benefits. We see the possibilities. But something inside of us is scared, fearful, worried. We're going to get rejected. It's not going to work out. And uh, so what we, it was a really vulnerable moment. And what we realized, what one of the other architects shared, Ian, who's part of the design council, uh, mentioned, he's like, you know what? The first thing you got to do is you got to, you got to recognize that you're worth it. You have to believe that you're worth it. You got to believe that you're valid. And that's, that's just a battle that happens in the mind. I love it. I love it. Ian, he basically said, I, I love the way he put it. He said that, you know, quoting a proposal and the negotiation, everything that happens, it doesn't happen in the other person's mind. It, it all happens in our mind. And I just, I just love that idea. So indeed there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, everything starts internally before it gets manifested or happens externally. So no doubt about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've experienced that too. Like i since I joined you guys, I, I went from my 10%, you know, basic architect's fee to 12. I'm actually considering raising it again. And when I did that, I started to think of myself differently. Like I'm not just scrapping at the bottom. Mm. I'm, I'm actually here um, kind of commanding higher fees because I'm worth it. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, when I think about the, the attitudes that, 
everybody wants the services that I provide. Everybody, you know, even when they can't afford anything, they still want them. But it's it's only with my permission that, that they were allowed to have my services for free. And what I found is like the conversations that I've had with people about why it is that I need to be honored with being paid what I'm worth um, are so much easier to happen now. They may not agree, and that's their prerogative. They don't, they don't have to agree, and they don't have to hire me. Um, or they don't need to continue to work with me. But if they want what I can offer, then they do have to pay. And that's the only way that I can make my business work and my life work. So, you know, I think that was a big mind shift for me, just understanding that if I don't, if I'm not being paid what I'm worth, I can't make my life work. And, and that's, that's really kind of tragic in a way, but it's a, it's a really wonderful thing too. I mean, it's sort of like, again, you know, we, we look at our attitudes, there's a piece of me that would really focus on the tragedy of all my bad attitudes. And now I'm looking at all of the, you know, being forward thinking. It's sort of like all the wonderful attributes of changing my attitudes. And there's many of them. It's sort of like, what do you want to focus on, Dewey? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, this reminds me of a conversation a couple of weeks ago I had with our, our marriage therapist that my wife and I go to is a great, he always has a lot of great insight, but he, he said, he said that a client of his recently told him something that really resonated that, um, the flag that we want to die on is not the flag of empathy or compassion. In other words, in our relationships with other people, you know, that shouldn't be like the last, the, the thing that we're going for is like, you know, the empathy and compassion that's important. But he said the flag that we, that we should be willing to die on is, is our own dignity. I thought that was very interesting because a lot of times, and this speaks to this conversation about wanting to be compassionate, wanting to be empathetic in our relations with our clients um, at the cost of our own dignity oftentimes is what we find. Absolutely, yeah. Right? And so it's interesting when we look at, no, no, it's not, you know, yes, empathy and compassion is important, but even more important than that is the dignity, the dignity that I have as a professional, the dignity that you have as a client, and let's just respect each other's dignity. And and if you're not respecting my dignity, that's on me because I have the opportunity to tell you no and to walk away and to say this isn't working. And if you continue to do it, then I'm complicit in this behavior just because I allow it. Yep, absolutely. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, what, I mean, go ahead. Well, I, I just feel like Again, it was always easier, I guess, or it is easier for me to think about res- about maintaining that dignity and respect for my business than it is for myself, mm-hmm. which is a little bit strange. Um, but I also find like, you know, we, we do a lot of cold calling and stuff like that, right? Or reaching out to people. It's always easier for me to reach out to people for some other um cause mm. than it is to reach out for myself. You've mentioned that before. We've talked about maybe like um, 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 nonprofit activities or, or uh, charities exactly. or things that you're, you're much more active in doing that. It's easier to do that. That's interesting. Yeah, what do you think is behind it's that? Almost like, well, I just think that there's a certain shame yeah. actually in, in trying to like say that people should think about using me, Nichols Design Group. Maybe they should use Nichols Design Group, but maybe not Dewey Nichols specifically. Yeah, specifically. yeah. Well, we're, we're getting yeah. very deep here, but it's very, it's, it's part of the human experience because I've felt the same thing. You know, there's, there's, I don't know if it's the culture we're raised in or what it is, but there's a part of us that, you know, we, we, our, our parents, our parents tell us to share with little Jimmy, share with little Susie, you know, and then before you know it, they're taking that toy away and they're giving it to Jimmy and Susie. And then we, we grew up believing that like, you know, oh, I guess the way to be in this world is that I have to sacrifice my own personal desires, my wants, my my dignity to make peace with other people. And um, at some point we get, we finally maybe just get so fed up that that strategy, we, it just, we can only do that so long before we be, just explode because we're not having any dignity for ourselves. Right. Destroys your life actually when you're yeah. just giving everything away. Absolutely. Yeah. What, um, tell me for you and your world, what are some, uh, let's talk about some, what does a trouble client look like in your world? Let's have some trouble. Client. You don't need to mention any names. But what are some examples of things that uh, that 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 would that that clients do 
that that are lacking the dignity and that um, that you've experienced in the past? Well, to start, I think every one of them is scared, and different people have a different way of expressing their fear. So I have one client that is so needy; it's like concert phone calls all day long, and it's like hand holding, hand holding. In fact, that project's just wrapping up right now, and I'm just wondering <laughs> how they're like not having me to run to with all of their woes. Um, but, you know, playing couples therapist all the time, you know, it's like the husband and wife dynamic. And I think that's one thing we try to figure out early on in our interviewing process now is exactly what is that going to look like? Do we want to actually take on another needy couple? You know, it's, it's because it, it, it's not really, it's not healthy. Um, I've had clients who are, they want me for my service and they pay for it, but then they want to actually own the rights basically to the design. Um, I, I found that that is very problematic. They don't, um, they don't want me to publish their work and all that mm. kind of stuff. So our contracts have changed to make sure that that's understood upfront. Mm. If that's going to be a problem, I want to know it before I sign my contract. Mm. With them. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, you know, if a project takes you three years, you've only got so many three-year projects in your life. And you've only got so much time to capitalize on that growing portfolio. And if they don't let you do that, then they're depriving me of my future livelihood. Mm-hmm. So again, it's thinking of the business. And, and mm. I think that that's, that's been really important. Figuring out how um, people are going to be potential problems is, is kind of my focus at this point through the interviewing. Um, I've had a lot of cheap clients <laughs> kind of come looking for something for nothing. And I've gotten really good at figuring out that very quickly and just saying, no, thank you. And that's been great. That's been amazing because in the old days, Dewey would have right off, chase it down that rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. And it would have cost me years and mm. thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm. I don't do that anymore. Actually, the, the work that I do have now is very productive in terms of making sure that I'm capturing value and it's contributing back to my livelihood and, and that people are paying, paying up front and on time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it's so much easier when you keep that in order than when you would let it go because you were too afraid to speak up for yourself because you so to, value yourself. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned paying up front. This is something that, that we teach here at business of architecture. We're huge proponents of it, which is when possible, get your clients to pay you ahead of doing the work. There's so many industries where this happens. Uh, you know, you go into a store, you don't get to walk out with the product before you actually give them some money for it. You know, I think, uh, most, most, most businesses are like that. Even if the plumber comes over, He's, he's usually not going to leave unless I, you know, nowadays the smarter ones, they, they have a, they have a square or they have a little thing on their, on their phone where they just swipe it right there and they charge you before they leave, you know, um, medical professional, a lot of times you have to, you have to pay before you get service, depending on what your insurance does. Uh, if you're self payer things like that. Um, so this is a strategy that architects generally, the standard industry practice is the old way, which is invoicing, right? So we do the work, we invoice for it. So we do the work, 30 days pass, we invoice for it. Uh, Usually the client is a 30-day invoice, they'll pay it 30 days later. So when we look at that, that's problematic from, hugely problematic from a cash flow perspective because we're doing, we're actually already paying our staff or ourselves for the work that we did and we're not getting paid for another 30 or another 60 days if they pay on time. And... um, this becomes extremely problematic when a when a when an architectural practice starts to grow, because if you think about it, with the growth curve that's happening, they're actually doing more work and they're not getting paid for that extra work till a couple months. Does that make sense? So, for instance, they might they might have to bring on a new team member. Now they've increased their their payroll, but they're not getting that money from the larger projects until a month or two or even three down the line. And so, the cash flow just disappears. It's extremely hard. So this uh, getting paid in advance strategy. Uh, subscription had, model. Yep, subscription model. Tell, tell us about that. This is something that, that we teach and help firms implement as well. What's the I subscription I started doing model? that probably 
six months ago. Um, Ryan introduced me to it. And of course, you know, I was old school because I'm very old school. Um, it seemed shocking to me, but what did see, seem appealing was this notion that billing could be easier because mm. what, what I would have to do before was analyze how far was I along with each phase. Mm-hmm. And then I would, I would, you know, it was just a lot of calculation, a lot of math and nobody else could do that for me. Only yeah. I could really do it. And, and so billing was, was almost like a dreaded event because mm. it was so much work. And, and then Ryan said, you know, try this. And so I tried it with one client and I just said, you know, you're going to pay me up front for the work I'm going to do the next month. That's the way I work. I just said, this is the way I work, even though it wasn't. And they're like, okay. And I'm like, well, that was easy. And then every, <laughs> every month after that was just one, two, three. It was just clockwork. I would just keep a tally of what they paid me so far and then what the next, you know, where they were in the schedule because we would amortize it over like 12 months. And I tell you, it was just so easy. So then I did it with another client and another client. So now it's just like what I'm going to do with every client because it's easier for them. There are regular payments that they can predict, put it into their schedule of you know financial payments and they're happy and, and no surprises, right? And it's great. It, it actually, it's really, and, and billing this month, it took, took me probably an hour mm, wow, to complete beautiful. it. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Right. Amazing. I mean, yeah, from a client's perspective, um, you know, if I'm a client, I would not like to get a small bill one month and a large bill the next month because that it's just harder to keep track of my personal finances. But if I just know it's going to be 5K a month, 10K a month, whatever it is, every single month, 12K a month, I just, which is no great. We'll put that on autopilot. We'll automatically draft it from the bank account. And then from your perspective, you can start to see how much work you have in the pipeline, depending on how much money you have coming in every month. And it's, don't you find it so much easier to manage that? It is. Yeah. And it's very yeah. predictable. Yeah. You, you know exactly where you are. And it also makes you more aware that pipeline is so important because as you work your way through your payments, you know, oh, this one's not going to be contributing back to my cash flow in, in five months. So you have five months to get your, jump together yeah, and and make sure that you've got a new project picked up where that one left off if you want to make this certain amount of money every month. Yeah, yeah, so. it's beautiful. Uh, something you said earlier, Dewey, I was thinking when you said, you know, a lot of times if, if we're doing residential architecture, working with a husband-wife couple or husband-husband couple or wife-wife couple or a, a pair of partners, um, then <laughs> I was, I wonder if any architect offers like a bolt on therapist service. <laughs> <laughs> that might be goes very valuable. <laughs> I mean, to disclosure, I've done therapy basically all my life. So I'm, I'm probably pretty voiced at how that all works. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but I think, you know, with couples, we call it couples therapy, but it's really not. I mean, it's just a matter of negotiating between two people, making sure that everybody's heard, making sure that 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 one person, unless they want it, isn't overpowering the other person. But yeah. I find um, very often that the one that isn't heard is the one that gets upset. And that mm. can actually, that can really destroy the whole dynamic. Mm. So, mm. because if, if it's bad enough that it's causing some sort of rift in, in that partnership, they're probably going to like, blame you for it yeah and cancel the project Indeed. it's really important to hear the one that's not talking that's that that's is a great point yeah i was just thinking about uh my my uh interior design our, our challenges with myself and my wife so uh, we have very different tastes and uh, it has been a sore point of contention for us so we would be one of the problem couples. I was thinking, actually, if there was a bolt-on, if there was like a communication specialist, if there was literally like a therapist that was hired to help the husband and wife come together on decisions, that would be a service that I'd be willing to pay extra for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, and if you need therapy, yeah, to help you get through this project, we have the right person for yeah, you. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Yeah, we'll make it happen. Let's face it, the um. Uh, the relationship isn't worth uh, ruining. The relationship is not worth getting the project done, right? So my relationship exactly. is more valuable, and I want to make sure my relationship succeeds. 
Well, Dewey, thanks for joining me today. Uh, you've had a lot of growth. I mean, just incredibly crushing it. Uh, you were already doing amazing projects there in the Boston area. You still are. But it, what I'm hearing from you is it sounds like there's a new level of excitement. There's a new level of uh, a new lease on architecture, a new, a new vision, dreaming big. How does it feel to be in this place as you've, as you've worked with the business of architecture team over the past year? In two years. Yeah, well, we're we're going on to year three as of this next month, yeah. and I feel like I'm I'm really expectant of of the changes and, and having them manifest because it's sort of like you said a long time ago. You do the first year, it's sort of like you hear it. Second year, you start to think about it. And the third year, you start to practice it. So. I'm really kind of excited about practicing it. I have to say, I'm so mindful now about marketing um, and I wasn't before. And and like I'm getting rid of ineffective marketing um, strategies and I'm implementing or trying new ones to see which ones will be more effective. And that that's actually very exciting. The actual potential of, of consistently bringing in more business is like a big deal. Mm. So, very mm. exciting. Beautiful. Uh, so far, any marketing strategies? When you say marketing, what is marketing in your world? Do we just, for people that are listening? It's a lot of networking, yeah. um, being in, in the right groups, um, yeah. you know, I'm in some chambers, um, and then going to like events sponsored by magazines and stuff like that, just getting out and meeting other colleagues um, in the profession. Um, I do... I just started a, a newsletter. I've, I'm already getting positive feedback from that. Um, but the notion that all when I'm out having coffees with people, there's I'm going to have follow up with them. I think it's a very cool thing because it's like they don't have permission to forget yeah. <laughs> to forget me yeah. like they used to. Yeah. It's like I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay in touch. But it's in a way that it's not draining me because. It's like um, an email broadcast and, and and everybody gets to see the most recent project or we get to discuss a topic or whatever. And the other thing that I've been doing are, are these Zoom um, panel discussions about supply chain and the, uh, the exorbitant interest rates, and how that's impacting the industry, um, you know, cost of labor, you know, and usually I have, you know, about 15 people on the call. So they're somewhat smaller, but everyone always gets so much out of them. And I think that was actually surprising to me was, was how positively they were going to be received. I, I never would have predicted that. But, and it, they're so easy to do because everybody talks about their own little way of looking at some problem. And then, and then everybody gains from that perspective. It's really a neat thing. Mm. I like, I like those a lot. So I'm just, you know, it's about growing my network and and then staying in touch with my network and, and mm, providing yeah. value. That way yeah. maybe people will think about me when it's time to, oh, I need an architect. <laughs> yeah, perhaps they will. I love it. Yeah, that's simple. Yep. All right. Well, Dewey, thanks for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast and sharing a, a bit of your journey and a little bit behind the scenes of what it's like to work with the team here at Business of Architecture. It's been my pleasure. All right, dude. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah. One more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.